o'clock, top of the hour, and I want to welcome everyone to this uh, month's event. And it's uh, starting out to be a very good day. I think uh, we're done with the Arctic blast. I actually kind of woke up kind of sweaty this morning. Okay, so so uh, so today I want to introduce uh, Jonathan Zimmer to uh, uh, being our guest speaker for today. And just a little bit of background about Jonathan. He's had over 23 years of experience in environmental health and safety, and he's obtained both his undergrad and advanced degree from the University of Finley, which is in Ohio, of course. And he's also has two designations behind his name. One is the CSP, and the other one is a uh, CHMM, which is a Certified Hazardous Materials Manager, which makes him a professional member with ASSP. And as far as the industries that Jonathan's been involved with, with all these uh, 23 years, he's been in the food, manufacturing, chemical, uh, automotive parts supplier, whether it's tier one or tier two suppliers. And he's also uh, been at the corporate level in his capacity. And as a professional member with ASSP, he currently serves as the uh, in the uh, administrative uh, assistant in the manufacturing practice specialty. And uh, also he was the past president of his Southwest Ohio chapter. And he was also the former regional uh, VP for our region seven, which of course now chat Brandon has. And so uh, in his current role, he works for uh, Kellogg company in the EHS supply chain as a director out there in Ohio. So with that, please welcome Jonathan. And uh, today, Jonathan's topic is going to be safety leadership. What does it look like? Hopefully we kind of know what it looks like. What's new and what's next in our field? So stay tuned and uh, welcome aboard, Jonathan. Leaving it up to you. All right, now. All right. thanks. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I left uh, the the cold weather in Ohio, and I'm actually calling from San Jose. Had our plan out here this this week, so it's you know nice and a balmy 60 or 70 degrees. So don't be jealous for that. Um, but uh, yes, I'm Jonathan Zimmerman. Uh, we're going to cover safety leadership, what's new and what's next. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or um, and I'll try to stay stay paying attention to that while trying to multitask with running the slides and everything else. Um, so I'm just going to go through it. Uh, you had kind of what, what my background is, but I really, whenever I do presentations on safety leadership of my folks here at Kellogg, um, I always start out with why is safety important to you? Um, when we go into this conversation, that's always something that I um, like to do. And I'm just giving you an example of how I start the meeting. Um, and, and we go around the room, we have a little bit of fun with it. And, you know, then it gets pretty serious and people start thinking about why they're there and why safety is so important. So, you know, for example, I always, I always show pictures of things I'm involved in, you know, going in the, being in the outdoors. Um, my, my boy scout uh, there, um, you know, my involvement in different organizations where I serve on different boards and then a, a group there on the bottom left that we have on LinkedIn called the Safety Shepherds, where we we just uh, a bunch of uh, Christian safety professionals get together um, voluntarily and we just share share things. And we've really been focusing on servant leadership, which ties in a lot to what we're going to talk about today, because servant leadership is a lot about what our profession is. So. We, we just do a lot of things like that when we open up and we go around the room. I have this thing called a thumb ball that has questions that you toss around to everybody and wherever your thumb lands, you have to answer that question. Uh, you can order on, on Amazon.com or buy a beach ball and put make up questions that you write with a marker on it and wherever they catch it in their thumb lands, it's kind of a good icebreaker to start the meeting off with. So we don't have, we can't do that virtually, but you know if you're having an in-person one, that's something definitely to look at. So we're gonna we're gonna jump into just a lot of the the things that are out there right now that 
that I've been focusing on in, in within Kellogg's and with within just my profession and just as I pay attention to what's going on out there. And one of the new things out of the Toledo Museum of Art, believe it or not, um, so you're not too far from Toledo up there in Michigan, um, and this um, concept called visual literacy, there's a group with the, the National Safety Council started this through the Campbell Institute research called COVE, which is the Center of Visual um, Excellence. And it teaches people by looking at artwork and analyzing artwork, how to take that to the workplace and look out for safety. So we all have visual bias. You ever gone somewhere and you you're in a plant for the first time and you walk by something and point something out to the person you're walking with and they're like, I've walked by that a hundred times and I've never seen it. Um, that's we get very kind of pigeonholed and, and, and used to seeing things. And then, you know, what this all says is once you see something, you can't unsee it. And we're going to practice this here in a minute. And you're always filling in the blanks based upon what you expect to be there. This can, so I, this is kind of what I share with my Kellogg folks. So a gimba, in case you don't know that, is a Japanese term, which is basically the production floor. So we always talk to our folks about going to the gimba, doing a gimba where we go out to the floor and observe and look for safety things. So just to show you how much this impacts us in our daily lives, not just in safety, but let's, so let's practice real quick. So look at the picture for a minute. And if you see anything, feel free to write it in the chat before I go to the next page. Oh, I went to the next page already, but it was blocked. So there's the picture in black and white, but when you add color to it, Do you see the hazard right there? Now, every time you go back and look at that picture, you're going to see, you can pick up that little uh, cheetah on the, the plains of the Serengeti in Africa, um, getting ready to pounce on and, and attack something. So just, just something that, you know, once you see that, that that's really what they teach you to do. Um, you know, this is one of the example in the research paper that I had. Um, you, you can look at this picture and probably assess that those steps look like they're probably not the same height if you look closely you know if you really analyze the picture and there's a handrail missing on the left hand side so you know we have those discussions and talk about it but there's a whole class you can check out cove um, and and look at it but it's they do sessions and um, pretty interesting thing and who would have thought we'd be learning from the Museum of Art in Toledo about how to look for safety. Um, the other, the other big thing, and again, this is kind of looking at the next stuff out of the gate here, and we're just going to go through this um, here. But the other big uh, topic of discussion right now um, is human and organizational performance, also called HOP. Um, couple of the big names here, these aren't all of them, but if you've ever heard Dr. Todd Conklin, um, I think he lives in New Mexico. You can find him on LinkedIn. He does podcasts and stuff like that. And there's also an organization called Fisher Improvement Technologies called FIT. Um, and they, they really talk a lot about this. A couple of years ago at the ASSP conference, Dr. Conklin and uh, um, oh, Scott Geller, Dr. Geller, had a good discussion about what is the difference between behavior-based safety and HOP and, you know, kind of going back and forth and having a great discussion about why we're, HOP is more important or why it's kind of over overtaking um, safety, behavior-based safety um, and those types of things. If you, if you missed it, I'm sure you can find it somewhere, but that, that's kind of where this, you know, was really started coming to the forefront. And really it's, you know, if you think about it, none of, I always, I put the perfect symbol with the slash through it because none of us are perfect. Um, so at home, on the road, or at work, do do our high-performing employees make errors? Do our underperforming workers make errors? Does management make errors? Do frontline workers work, make errors? Do we, do we make errors? 
I, I'd say, yeah, I, I make errors. I, I know we all make errors. And, and that's kind of what this human performance is talking about is recognizing that none of us are perfect and that there are er errors there. And what are we going to do about that? So, you know, it's all about our system. The second bullet point is, is what's, um, what we worry about. And again, this concept applies not just to safety, but to quality, food safety, how we make our product, all those types of things. Um, so are our systems robust and strong and resilient enough to absorb any of the mistakes by preventing a deviation from the expected outcome? So, you know, do we have systems that are going to put it, we put into place to counter these, um, these things, these human performance things that we talk about. And these are the areas um, that where we tend to be error prone. And what the, this is where you have to ask yourself in your organization, what do I have in place? What do we have in place to counteract these error trends or traps? So Here's some things, if you think about it, we could all probably agree if we first time are in frequent task, overconfidence, if we really think we are, we, we know what we're doing and, you know, we don't want to hear from anybody else on how to make it better or anything like that, that's, that's an error trap. If we have poorly guide, written guidance or it's vague or poor or unclear communications, we can all say uh, communications is a big deal, stress, high workload, time pressure. Uh, distractions, you know, outside of work with COVID-19, we've all had a lot of distractions this year or in 2020 and this year. End of shift or work cycle or extended shift. Um, and then this is one that, that I really found interesting too from the research is the first day you're back after being away from a site or from the plant or from your job for four days or more, that's really an, a time where you're trying to get the cobwebs out and get back to the, into the swing of things. Um, so one of the things that is a big trend, I think, not just in Kellogg's, but other industry is hand injuries. And um, so that, you know, we, what I say is think about all the hand injuries we've had at, at our site or in, in our workplace and how much of them are tied to some of these things if we really look at them. And then things like when we when maintenance is doing work or we're cleaning things, those are all kind of times when when a lot of this can come into play. If a maintenance person hasn't done the task before or only does it does it once a year, that's an infrequent task, and we need to be at a higher level of managing that. So some of the things that we you know you think about what what we have in place in organizations, we have things like. Um, SOPs, checklist. I'm going to show you this document here called a safe plan of action, which handles non-routine work. Um, onboarding processes, engineering controls, uh, risk observations are behavior-based safety. Um, they could be anything, you know, you, every organization has different things. It could be DuPont type things or safe start type things. Um, Pre-task self-checks. Um, I've seen those in some organizations and then one of the things is just the follow up on corrective actions, especially from near misses and, and things like that. So um, those are tools and, and you think about it, your work site probably has a bunch of examples, but if you go back and look at these triggers, think about and kind of just brainstorm what, what are some things that you've, um, that you have in place to counteract those. And, you know, you might come up with a list similar or have additional things. Everybody tracking with me good? Okay. Um, so the other big, big discussion topic over the last, you know, I'd say probably started about a decade ago, but it's really picked up steam here recently, is this whole concept of SIF, which is severe injury fatality injuries, and really talking about trying to get ahead of them and getting them before they become those severe severe injuries. So let's go through this. There's there's a ton of research on this as well, but just kind of, you know, this is just some of the highlights you'll see in some of the documentation. Overall in, in OSHA, the BLS data, our injuries are down over the over the decades. 
but our fatalities are kind of staying in a steady state and kind of plateaued. And actually this past year, they went up a little bit. So um, those, those are kind of what we're seeing there. And one of the things that research from BECRA and, and other organizations have this pyramid here that's basically in the middle, you have these severe injuries and they follow kind of, they're kind of a narrower path on the pyramid of, of injuries. And we got to look at these in a little bit more detail to start preventing these lost time and severe injuries that, you know, and fatalities that really impact the workers. So this, this is the quote, for, I think this is from Decra. Um, it, when I was when I was with them and they presented to us at Kellogg's was we are getting better at preventing the bee stings, but what about the life altering event? So, and so this is the official def definition that that a lot of organizations use, a lot of the research uses. Um, one of the things that really we focus on and that we're starting to focus on is the potential SIFs. There's the last bullet point here, the near misses and minor incidents with potential to have serious consequences. They're free lessons. And if we can implement things for them, we can get better at um, preventing the more serious ones. So here's, and leadership drives all this. And here's kind of the big categories where, you know, you have to have your plant manager, your leadership of your company asking these questions when something happens around one of these topics. So if we have a near miss or a, an injury that deals with lockout tagout or working on or near the hazardous energy, uh, machine safety, like machine guarding, electrical work, confined space entry, elevated work for fall protection, um, mobile equipment, pedestrian segregation is another big one. You know, how do we make sure that those two don't interact as, as often? And then in the food industry, we use a lot of cleaners and sanitizers, and we all are using a lot of cleaners and sanitizers with, um, with COVID precautions. Um, but if you use those incorrectly, if you think about all those categories, if something goes significantly wrong in one of those, you're going to have a potential SIF, severe injury or fatality. So those are kind of, if you look at a decision tree, those are the big ones to really start with as you, as you go through and look at, at SIF and PSIF. Somebody had a chat here. Yep. All right. Um, so even, even, you know, if you think about it, how how the equipment runs in your plant um and you know we always try to explain to people if we can keep our equipment running perfectly and don't have jam ups and we don't have downtime where maintenance has to intervene um we're less likely to have these sifts because of the machine safety and hazardous energy type concepts so and again you know same thing here we we've we've talked about i'm going to get into some of those Here's, here's kind of a list of, of uh, SIF potential um, that, that we have, that we developed. Um, this is very difficult to navigate through. So we have more of a simple flow chart dealing with these, these uh, seven policies up there. And if you have something in one of those, it's considered a PSIF. And if that's a, if that's a near miss, we go through our root cause problem solving and, and address those types of things. Um, so that's, that's some examples there. You can see all the different things. Now, for our industry, we have a lot of combustible dust. So anything we have an in incident with combustible dust, we're definitely dealing with it. Ammonia as well. We have some uh, plants make, that make Ego waffles where you use ammonia to refrigerate. So we typically will, if something happens there, we consider it a, a PSIF and do a full-scale investigation. So. Just an example um, of, of how to do it. I, I prefer the simpler approach where you have the seven bullet points. And if you answer, if any of the injuries or near misses are in that category, they're considered a SIF. All right. 
so those are those that's a lot of the new stuff that's um that's out there some of this stuff now i'm going to just kind of talk about what i've what i hear and see from everybody out in the industry and you know some of it challenge us a little bit to think a little bit differently on some things um you don't have to you know Get, take everything I say, you know, as as the gospel or anything, but definitely just I always like looking and hearing different uh, perspectives from people, and um, that's kind of what I'm going to get into a little bit here and and show some videos to make it a little bit interesting. Um, so the other big thing that we've been dealing with for a while is is zero injuries, and I would say as, as a safety leader, as in our, our management ranks and our plant managers, our VPs, the two things that really, they can really drive for us is this whole concept of safety is a value, which we all, we've had, we've heard that discussion for years. It's not a priority, it's a value. So ingraining it in your culture so that it's a value. And the second thing I really say is zero injuries. Now, everybody always argues, well, that's an unrealistic expectation. Well, maybe, but I say it's a mentality that you, that's what you should be striving for. And that should be the focus is we don't want to see that. And when we have something happen, we want to attack it with all our effort to make sure it doesn't happen to the next person. So the whole zero injury discussion, I think is, is interesting. You know, I looked in some of the companies like Exxon has has their motto is nobody gets hurt. Alcoa has um, something where zero is possible. Um, and, you know, everybody has some kind of statement around zero. And I would say it is it is possible and, and we it's something to work for and strive for. And it's what we should be striving for as safety leaders in our organization. So one of the things. And I can send me slides or put them in a PDF and send them out. And Brian and Rich, you guys can share them with the group. Um, but one of the things that um, I was at a, at the National Safety Council conference last, well, the last time they had it in person in San Diego, and um, they had a person there. And I I'll, the YouTube link here, we don't have time to watch it today, but um, the person was talking about zero is not in you know the whole idea of things being not impossible it's easy to say it's possible but when it's not impossible it kind of changes your mindset um and he he talked about it's a commitment and he, you know he was talking and i'm like he should be a safety leader here so he, you know he said no matter how gnarly this is his quote from that that youtube click clip um is no matter how gnarly niche System, systemic or structural the problem, we believe changing the world starts with a commitment. And then a head first dive into the mess of making things, you know, he talked about things like accessible healthcare, food insecurity, society's biggest problems can be solved with fewer echo chambers and more elbow grease. So it was just a, it was a good wake up call for, for me, kind of that whole, adding that not in front of the, the possible, it's not impossible, means it kind of changes the way you the perspective you have of what you're looking at and and really it, it really has done that for me and um you know let's go and, and attack this and and try to make it better and and work towards that and eventually we'll get there so you'll have the youtube link you can check it out it's a probably a, i think it's like a five to 15 minute video um and not impossible labs is what his company is is called and it just was a it was a, a kind of a refreshing perspective the other thing as as a safety leader i like to do um is really take lessons from real world events and tie them to ehs because oh it's easy for us to talk about what's going on in our facility, our workplaces and, and everything like that. But what what are some of the lessons we can learn from history? What are some of the lessons we can learn from from different things that have happened in in the real world? Um, so I at the time at, at, when the Chernobyl thing uh, mini series on HBO came out, I watched that with just I was just sucking in all the lessons there from from a safety perspective. Yes, I am a, a safety nerd at times. Um, don't say anything, Brian. Um, so um, importance of safety culture, uh, 
you know, they, the, the, really the lesson there was it's important to stop and regroup. Um, so they were going through a test in Chernobyl and then everything went crazy. And then instead of the people that were running the test saying time out here, let's regroup, they continued through and we know what happened. Um, some of the people that were in charge, I think were complacent and overly confident. Um, and they weren't really respecting the hazards and the risk. Uh, the MOC management of change that test plan from what from what uh, the rec the investigation showed wasn't very thorough and a lot of handwritten notes and and things like that they were going someplace they hadn't gone before. You know the other thing is do emergency shutdowns work and were they tested? You know are they tested? If you have those situations in your workplaces um, with hazardous operations or chemical facilities or anything where there's an emergency shutdown, do they work and are, have you tested them lately? Um, coordinating with emergency responders, are you prepared to handle the worst case scenario? And then, you know, they lost a lot of, a lot of people in the Soviet Union blame this whole incident as really being the, the kind of the really what started spiraling the Soviet Union out of control because they tried to cover it up. And the more you can get bad news out, get it out ahead of bad news and talk to everybody up the chain and, and really get it communicated, the better off you are. Um, so that was kind of the lessons there. But, you know, you could do the same thing if you watch the movie Deepwater Horizon. There's a new Challenger uh, miniseries on Netflix that I just finished watching. There's some lessons there. The Dark Waters movies for the uh, the chemical plant for DuPont in West Virginia that um, contaminated water and caused some health issues for the neighbor or the community and the animals and stuff like that. Um, those are all things you can watch. And even always paying attention to news, like in the food industry right now, we're all, we all saw what happened in Georgia through two to, was it three weeks ago with the nitrogen freezer? where there was a major leak of liquid nitrogen at that food meat manufacturing plant and it killed six people. So paying attention to those things, that's what leadership is and making sure that we look at those and learn from them. Um, but you know, this is, these are ways to really drive it home to others and really just different perspective of, of how to get that in front of people. So I, I always say that um, safety leadership, a lot of it is, it looks like trust and respect. So, you know, and I'm a big believer in consistency. Um, so whether you're the plant manager, the EHS manager, or the person um, making whatever product you're making, you have to treat them all consistently when it comes to safety and, and a lot of other things as well. And when you get that consistency and you build up the trust, the people are going to come to you. They're going to, you're going to get that respect. You're going to have people bringing things out. Um, and just those are times when they bring things to your attention, then you have the great opportunity to fix things. And then that just self perpetuates into a, a great cycle of, of improving the workplace. Really, I, I think if you look and there's been a bunch of research on this at Alcoa. And, and when Paul O'Neill started in there, one of the things is he built up the trust of the people. And then, and he started by focusing on safety. And when that happened, he gained the respect. And um, the rest, if, if you read the chapter in, that, in, in the book, um, The Power of Habit, or you can find it on Google if you search for it, um, is just his history because he gained that trust and respect. And, turn that company around and had great success. And it all was based upon keeping people safe and working on the safety first. Here's a, here's a, so safety leadership, when, when we talk about it, it's more than just than talk, it's, it's also action. So I, I found this video I've always used for a long time and it really kind of drives home a good point. Hopefully it works. Uh -oh, maybe not be able to hear it. Okay, the video didn't work, did it? You can't hear it. The power of Zoom. So in this in this video, and I can see the link is is in the later on in the slides, but it's it's this bucket. Um, 
and everybody's walking by that in this hospital setting and nobody addresses anything and this person carrying things she can barely see around trips over the bucket and falls and hurts herself so the point of the video is put it away before put it away while it's still a bucket and not an injury um, and I always tell people um, if you ever get, have gotten an email from me I always at the bottom of my email tagline it says you get the level of safety you're prepared to walk past so safety leadership of that is about if you see a safety risk even if there's some big issue going on in quality or something like that and you're walking by and you see somebody doing something unsafe or a safety half hazard you need to divert and go fix the safety risk and you gain people's um, attention that way because when you walk by something that they know you saw you're condoning that unsafe practice. So as a safety leader, it is engaging in doing that and, and you know addressing things and not walking past them. So if you think about it, that's a pretty good quote. You get the level of safety you're prepared to walk past. And it's very hard in, in our profession. And one of the things I always talk about is why do trick plays work? Okay, at the risk of making everybody mad, like when, when Ohio State beats Michigan every year, um, you know, why do trick plays work? Um, because it's it's complacency. I usually say jokes about the Bengals, or we could say jokes about the Lions because we both are, are not very good. But, you know, that's uh, that's one of the things the Steelers always do a trick play against the Bengals and it works every time because of complacency. So. I always remind people about complacency because it's the enemy of safety. Um, it's a sworn enemy. When we get complacent, when we think we're doing better than we are, when we say, all right, we're at 100 days without an injury, what happens the very next day? We, have, we go and celebrate and have a, a picnic or whatever for having a good safety performance for the month, and what happens the next day? Complacency is, is where that is, and then next thing we know, we have an injury. Uh, the deep water horizon what were they doing the day before that uh, that um, drilling well blew up they were celebrating like a year or more without a, any lost time injuries or serious injuries and then the, so the very next day they they had the unfortunate um, disaster that happened so complacency is a, a big thing to be aware of and, and really stress with everybody is if you feel yourself getting complacent, you need to take a step back and say, all right, what's going on here? What, what do I need to, to look at? And, you know, we do it all the time. I also really drive home the fact that as a safety leader, it doesn't end when we leave the workplace. Um, when we're in that car and we're trying to multitask, whether it's eat, drink soda be on our cell phones in a car you know driving that car that's dangerous um you know when we're mowing the lawn things like that when we're actually working on our homes and doing things are we being safe and setting the tone um and then i always tell people if you think about it if you have more than one kid um the first time you have you're bringing your your firstborn home from the hospital you're very focused on you even probably drive a little bit slower. You can make sure that you go to the fire department, make sure you install the, the child seat properly, those types of things. And, and the, but the next kid or the next kid after that, you're not as, as, um, as fine tuned into some of those things because you, you're a little bit more complacent, a little bit more comfortable. And, and those are, you know, that's, a, that's how we see complacency creep in and cause problems for us in safety. But if we as leaders understand complacency and, and start seeing the signs of it, we can get ahead of it and prevent, prevent problems. Um, the selective attention video, I'm not gonna show it because every time I show it, half the group has already seen it, but if you haven't, um, it's a video with a gorilla and a basketball and you're passing the basketball around and, and uh, you'd look at the video and, and learn from it when I send the slides out. But one of the things that complacency also drives is our selective attention. Are we paying attention to things well? Um, you know, we do that task for the first time, we have that checklist. 
And after we get it memorized, maybe, or we, we go through the motions, that's, that's what that selective attention is talking about. All right, we still doing okay, everybody? Okay. All right, so the other big debate um, is, is it safety first or safety always? So where this, this whole concept when it, when it comes to safety leadership came up is, I, I like Mike Rowe actually, and you know he tells it like it is. He's he um, he's really big on the trades and and really helping elevate them and understanding that trades are are a, a valuable thing in the in this in the workforce and we need trades people, uh, electricians, plumbers, everybody. But he also did that show called Dirty Jobs. Now, I'll admit I I used a lot of those videos of what did he do wrong type things when I did some training classes on some of those jobs. But one of the things that, you know, he talked about is he has this concept. He, he wrote a blog and you can Google it and find it called safety third. Well, that, that kind of put a lot of safety professionals in a tizzy because it's like, it's safety first, not safety third. And, and when you read his blog and, and challenge yourself to get past the headlines, um, he really was talking about safety always because he says, yeah, safety is first. If, if we just say safety is first, what happens when we get to the second thing on the list? He said safety should be ingrained in everything we do and, and we should look at it the whole time, not just at the beginning. So I really thought that was beneficial and, and just a, a thought provoking idea is it's something that should be part of. It's like when we say safety is a value, it's part of us. It's part of our cult culture. Safety always, it should always be there when we're doing a task, not after we get past the first checkbox. So just, just some things as, as, I, as we talk about leadership, I think it's, it's something that sometimes it's how we say things and, and people can take it the wrong way. Because he was telling the story where he was in a factory and they were going to get up in a scissors lift or something and they're only going like four feet off the ground. They had a lanyard that was six foot long and he was questioning the safety professional or safety person at the site about what, why am I having to wear this when it won't, it won't engage by the time I hit the ground. And the answer the guy gave him at that time was safety first. So that prompted him to write the whole blog. And he just was saying, you know, it should be something that's ingrained in everything we do and you can come up with other alternatives in a six foot lanyard to make sure that it engages properly. So um, just, just something to, to look at and, and definitely something that leaders can, can understand from. Another thing on leadership is safety leadership as we look at this is near misses. And why are near misses important? Um, and are they important? To, to your organization and to the leaders and, and, ex, and explaining to them why. Um, and one of the things with near misses that, that I've uh, challenged people with is, do you look at them as a good thing or a bad thing? So when, we, when everybody has these performance boards out in their plants nowadays um, that are implementing different work systems and work programs, and you look at first aid, you look at near misses in some cases, and you look at recordables, um, lost times, those types of things, and you color code it red or green. So when it comes to near misses, I see a lot of people color coding near misses as red, but as a leadership thing, aren't near misses a good thing that we want reported? So shouldn't it be red if we don't get any near misses reported? See how that mindset kind of shifts? So I, I always try to get people to say, all right, if it's a, if we had a near miss, we're green, and then go do something about it. But if we don't have a near miss, because we all know they're out there, I mean, I, I bet we could walk in our workplaces every day and find at least one, if not 10, um, and just making it, bringing that attention to it is because we always talk about the reds in our in our workplaces. So if we don't have a near miss reported, it should be red. And then we should say, all right, let's go find those near misses. All right, the other thing is what is a near miss? So there's a bunch of definitions out there and, and 
I've seen it to where you could have all of us, I could put a, a situation up on this screen right now and ask everybody on this call if it was a near miss. And we'd have uh, about 30, 36 different opinions about whether it was or wasn't a near miss. So that's, that's, um, that's something that um, you just have to refine and work on and get alignment on, um, as I found over time, to make sure you all look at it the same way. And then understand why aren't they reported and why are they important? Um, and then again, remember we talked about that SIF and if it's potential to have a SIF, those near misses should be elevated to a higher level. And here's how I drive this point home. So the really the, the airline industry dri have dri has driven the whole near miss reporting. If you really look at the research and the studies um, uh, for over 37 years, they've had over 1.1 million near misses reported. That's about 6,700 reported per month, if you do the math. Now, you know, this number is updated uh, obviously all the time, but if you wanna go and look that website link right there, um, they have them all there. They have the data available. And the beauty of this process is it's called the Aviation Safety Reporting System, but pilots can file it, flight attendants can file it, air traffic control, the ground workers, the maintenance people, all those people can apply and put in a near miss. And when they start seeing near misses, why do you think they, you always hear this airline, this model airplane is, is grounded for a certain period of time? It's because of all this data they're getting. Um, so I use this as an example of why near misses can be successful. So, you know, that's how, you know, as you educate leaders and as we look at it ourselves as leaders, the, the proof is in the pudding sometimes. And this is a great example of how to, to have that proof. So just some, some ammunition for your discussions there. So what, ho what holds us back from intervening in safety? So this is something else that as safety leaders, we have to be aware of. Um, and you know the whole concept of hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, those types of things. That's kind of what this is saying is why don't people intervene when they see somebody doing something unsafe? And I'm sure some of us can be in these situations ourselves and, and uh, have to overcome some of these obstacles. Um, and you, could, you can read all these as, as well, but some of the big ones to focus on is this, um, the bystander effect. So this, this newspaper clip, clip up here on the top right with, um, from the New York Times, Kitty Genovese from 1964, she was getting um, robbed and attacked, and there were 37 people at the apartment complex she was at that were out watching, but none of them called the police because they thought somebody else was handling it um, or something to that effect. So sometimes the bystanders, we see something happening and we think somebody else has done something about it. Well, that's why we might not jump in. The other one is that deference to authority. So if someone at a higher rank than you is doing something unsafe, a lot of people won't say anything, um, but th those are that's those are things to be aware of. Fear of punishment. Um, you know, we're trying to understand. Ra we rationalize with ourselves why not to do something. We know that if we do give feedback, there's going to be a lot of defensiveness. So those are all things that um, to get into that. But being aware of those and educating people on those is really about leadership. So when when you walk on the floor and somebody says, hey, you're, where's your, because uh, we all forget, where's your earplugs? Where's your safety glasses? Um, you should thank somebody for telling you instead of getting defensive as a leader. So those are all things that really can help drive the culture. And this, this is one of the things we talked about earlier, the safe plan of action. We call it an SPA, not a SPA, but a SPA. Um, safe plan of action for non-routine tasks. These are some things that you do to to get ahead of of things. Um, and and this is where remember we talked about human performance. Doing something non-routine is a high risk risk time of our workplace. Um, so this helps do those get those things under under 
kind of an umbrella of what the risks are and what we're doing about it. Um, and we use these things for um, anything we don't do frequently, something that's not something we've ever done. Um, and if we're doing something that's out of the norm. So it's a simple form um, where we document what the risks are and then what's our plan, our safe plan to address that. And then the beauty of it is all the team members involved are in, are signing off on this process to make sure that we haven't missed anything, and um, and then the supervisor as well, and then we implement it. We do have a checklist to kind of help fill out the first part. It's the back page, um, and then you do this. And I always tell people one of the things when I go and do an audit or something like that is. I always can tell when they filled some of these forms out in the office and not actually where the, the work is happening. So always telling people, make sure you do these things right where it is. And if, if, a, if a, uh, a manager or safety leader at the work site is walking through and sees one of these taking place, they should walk over and verify. And then if it's well job well done, hey, good job. Thanks for doing this and thanks for getting involved and, and doing this the right way. And if there's an opportunity to fix things, telling everybody, all right, let's take a time out and let's come back here. Um, I was reviewing this and might have missed this. But by looking at those things, it drives the importance. So just just those are things that we as leaders can do to, to help improve safety cultures. All right. Now, for me personally, this is you know, I, I do have an orange shirt on today. Uh, surprise, surprise. But I have always used um, orange kind of as a way to really drive home kind of safety awareness. And in some of the companies I've been, um, we we have days where we just wear orange just to kind of get everybody thinking about safety. It gives you that visual of, hey, when I see orange, I'm going to think about safety. Um, and we even took it at a, a previous company over to the, the the kids over at the daycare. They all wore, wore orange on the same day we did as workers in the in the factory next door. Um, at Christmas time, you actually can find orange Christmas trees. Um, so we had competitions um, uh, where we decorated it with safety gear um, at Christmas time. Um, Lockout tags. You, you can. They got. They got very creative um, with their with their orange Christmas trees. But so find those things that really get people's attention, and and when they that trigger something in their brain um, that you know where when they want to increase their safety level and safety knowledge. You that video is old. We won't show that one. Uh, COVID nineteen effect. Um, so we're all living through this right now. So as we think about safety leadership, this COVID-19 and our uh, response efforts have really driven kind of us to the, the higher levels in the organization. And we, we've gotten a lot more opportunity to, to be expressed and show our leadership in this. Um, and most plants and organizations that I've seen at EHS has really taken this on more than any other because you know, we're we're dealing with OSHA, the health departments and everything like that and putting the things in the place that we need to for COVID-19. So I put this in here because it's relevant. And as we look at safety leadership, we have to, you know, there's some lessons here from this whole whole thing as well. And if you remember in the beginning and even now adaptability. So when we are dealing with safety issues and big, big items going on, um, we have to be able to adapt to the change and adapt daily. So at the beginning of COVID-19, we we're all adapting daily to what was going on. Um, it's also technology. Look at that technology. What is out there that you can, can use to do uh, different things with? So virtual site visits and audits. There's Google Glass. There's a couple other different things. Microsoft Teams and a cell phone. We've actually done some virtual walkthroughs in, in Kellogg's where we've done use Microsoft Teams, get some uh, earbuds. You can get noise canceling earbuds and you can walk around and, and have you and you're still watching, but you can have your camera on yourself and pointing out and you can do some pretty good uh, in, investigations. Drone technology. 
you know, people are go doing roof inspections without having to go on the roof, which is, uh, re you know, improve safety because we don't have to put somebody up at that elevated level. So those are things to look at. Temperature screening. Um, I learned more about infrared cameras than I ever thought I would um, in early last year. Um, so they, you know, that technology. Then the big thing now is that everybody was working from home. And I'd say that you're going to see a lot more of that continue to happen um, where people have that ability to work from home. So you're going to see reduction in offices and then that switches things to how do we make sure people are working at home safely. And then business continuity plans. You know, even the snow last week in Snowmageddon in Texas and Tennessee, it really wrecked havoc there. Um, and what's the business continuity plans? And then the hierarchy of controls, if you look at all these different things that we put into place for COVID, um, you know, cleaning, uh, keeping people that are sick away from the plant, quarantining, all those things fall in that hierarchy of controls. And in the Swiss cheese model, where if you have the more layers of protection you have, the better off you're going to be because none of them are perfect. And they're all like a layer of Swiss cheese. If they line up perfectly, the incident could still happen. But you, you have, that's why you got to put more and more things in place and make sure they're done properly. So really, there's a lot of leadership lessons that we can share and, and learn and, and use um, from this. And then, and then I, I always... One of the things that I was concerned with and still am a little concerned with is, are we focused on the right things? Are we jumping to, to what we need to fix for COVID-19 without thinking about how it impacts health and safety? Um, and does COVID-19 trump occupational health and safety? So should you be putting people in N95 masks without a fit test if they need to wear it? Um, what about all these chemicals we're spraying to sanitize things with? Do we think about what, what we're doing there um, and, and what the exposure levels are? So, and the UV, everybody's now starting to use UV and what's the exposure there that's a potential thing. And I've heard, I've heard story after story where auditors, consultants are going to plants and doing a safety inspection they walk upon a lockout violation and the person's more worried about somebody not wearing a mask than the, the lockout violation. So just it's a balanced approach and realize that we still are safety professionals and some of these things, um, we also kind of have to remember that when we do them, there's an there's a impact on safety as well and we need to understand that and, and account for that um, and not just be so focused on the, the COVID-19. Here's a bunch of good uh, videos. That story of the bucket is there. Um, there's also ones for a ladder and tape and stuff like that. You can look at all these when I get the slides to you and you can check those out. Um, the other other thing is as we kind of kind of finish up here and I'll open it up for questions is the Campbell Institute um, for research, there's a, if you go to their website, which is part of the National Safety Council, there's a lot of good research on leading indicators, severe injury fatality, and what companies are doing about it. Um, visual literacy, which is that whole COVE concept at the Toledo Museum of Art, and then a lot about worker fatigue, health, and well-being. So there's some good, good information there. Um, and I always try, I always find good quotes from, from people in the, in the world that we all know and, and kind of bring them out. A true leader has the confidence to stand alone, the courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. He does not set out to be a leader, but becomes one by the equality of his actions and the integrity of his intent. So I say this probably pretty much summarizes us in the safety profession and what leadership is all about. Um, is you know being courage, having courage, um, confidence, and even if we have to be standing alone and be the only one um, there saying no, you're not going to run this process because it's not safe. That's that's a that's a good quote to live by. And then for 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 me and for others, you know, Vincent Van Gogh had this quote: "Your profession is not what brings home your weekly paycheck. Your profession is what you, you're put here on earth to do." 
with such passion and passion and such intensity that it becomes a spiritual and calling. So now this is for me personally, as the type of leader I am, um, that spiritual and calling thing really brought me, has always referred me back to this scripture in the Bible. Um, and it just talks about we're there, we're, you know, we're here to keep a care, take care of our flock. And that's really what we do as safety professionals. Um, and, and that's how I tie the two together, but that's what you have to do is you have to get, get to that level in, in our profession. And a lot of us are already there. And it's just, you know, that's just my, my advice of what I deal with. And as we go to questions here, I always, I, you know, this, this uh, billboard has been around a little bit, but, you know, I always like to remind people about outside of the workplace um, and, you know, texting while driving is not getting any better, even if they pass all the laws under the books, because we all seem to have problems with that. But with that, I'll open it up for any questions or feedback or anything like that. All right, uh, Jonathan, uh, before we get to the questions, I want to thank you for your uh, presentation. You had a lot of several good points that I think we can all walk away from. And uh, I also want to call out three notable uh, members in the audience. We're all leaders, but there are three leaders I do want to call out. One of them is Tom Kramer. He is the director at large at ASSP. He is also one of the recipient winners of the uh, President Award for 2017-18. And he sits on the ANSI Fall Protection. So he's a good guy to know if you got any questions about fall protection, he's the guy. The other guy I want to mention too is Brian Osepic. And Brian, he's our area director for the North area. And he supports us quite nicely. He used to be a uh, member of our West Michigan chapter, served as a president and various roles. And thank you for your service and support, Brian. And then the third person is Vito Carazino. He is the president of the GBSU student section and he's also here with some of his officers. So I wanna welcome him on board in attendance and uh, we'll go ahead at this point and open it up for questions. All right, I see I see some in the, the slot on the uh, chat section. So one question was whose commitment is needed most, the organization, management, the employee? I know all, all are involved, but who has the biggest share of the commitment? So. Wow, that's that that's a loaded question. I, I personally think, and and anybody can jump in here, but I I really think the organization and the the values that the organization sets is is so important because um, one of the things W. K. Kellogg, who's the founder of Kellogg's, for example, really believed in is people, and it's a founder's value to keep people safe. And, and that's really what we tie in safety to our founders values. So I really think that drives a lot of it, um, but it, it can't just be something that we say, it's gotta be the actions would be my biggest thing. But yeah, you lose it a lot in translation once you go from the top to the middle to the bottom of the organization, but that's where I would start. Um, um, any other questions or comments? Well, Jonathan, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, earlier in your program, you talked about uh, aiming for zero. Zero should be the mindset. Yeah. How do you deal with the uh, other side of that coin in terms of you're at hovering at zero, there are no recordables, and all of a sudden somebody gets hurt, but they're not willing to report because they don't want to be the bad guy that gets you be you know on the plus side of the recordables. Is is there a fear of underreporting? Put it that way. Well, I I I think it, it depends on the culture. I believe um, so. If if the culture really believes in that zero, is they're going to want to know about things. So even if they aren't going to be at zero they can go back. I think if you focus too much on the numbers sometimes, um, it really takes away from, from what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but that would be what I would say is, if it, it would be an indictment to me on the, on the, the culture is if, if we're hiding things or, or want, not wanting to report, the right thing to do as a safety leader would be to 
say, hey, okay, we've had this issue. Now what are we going to do about it? Because that is where you're going to gain, going to get to back to zero as quickly as possible and, and continue it even further. But it is a, I, yeah, all of us on this call who have ever dealt with injuries always have that discussion. Oh, is this, is this a recordable? Why? How do, you know, how do we, how do we, how can we get out of that? How can we make an argument or, or whatever? And, and that's, that's such a frustrating thing for most of us on this call, I'm sure. And, and it's, it's, um, it's that age old, age old discussion. So, um, but that, that would be where I would say is to explain to them, Hey, this is how we need to handle this because we're at zero now. And we, we have all this great culture that we're trying to, but if, if everybody's going to know that injury happened, and you're going to lose so much of your culture by not addressing it and saying, oh, it wasn't when people know that it was, that um, it's better to just take the bull by the horns and address it and, and confront the brutal facts. So. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. And my second question is uh, VPP, Volunteer Protection Program on the federal side. Yeah. And here in the state of Michigan, it's MVPP. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned two companies that have that distinction, uh, uh, for example, like Alcoa or the Hamid yeah. out there in Whitehall, Michigan, and the other one being uh, Dow Chemical. You guys seem to have all the programs in place to be right to being a candidate for VPP. Have you ever thought about going in that direction? If yeah, we had. If not, why not? Uh, we have we have our North Carolina facility um, is in a part of the Carolina Star, so we do have one site. Um, so it's it's not that we we don't see the the value in it. I think it depends on the plant. Um, you know, if they they really use it to drive their culture and and really want to strive for it, they can. I think there may be opportunities in the future, but. Um, so that that's a decision each company has to make, but that's we do have some the one, um, and we've talked about it. And some of our other plants internationally have some of the local, uh, the country specific, and then even like the state specific in that country. So, um, but that's that's where it is, and it's 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 a lot of work to get to VPP level. Um, and you know, it's th then it becomes a question of what's what's the what's the pros and cons um, and benefits to it. So, um, which there are benefits. I think if you're a plan and you're striving to get to that higher level, that's a great target to strive for. But if, if you're a plant that's been there pretty, you know, been performing pretty well for a while, um, you have to really justify and you have to cost benefit it to your management and because it's, it's an effort, um, a constant effort. But there's right. all kinds of pros and cons either side. Um, and, right. and, you know, you, you can go to other factories and get a bunch of best practice sharing. That's a, that's probably the biggest benefit that I feel. When I was with her and Miller, that's when we launched MVPP. Yeah. <laughs> to yeah. your point, it's a lot of work, but we did see a lot of uh, gain as a result yeah. of it. Yes. And that's, that's what we saw in Cary, North Carolina. And I, I'd say that um, there are some plants looking at it as well. They could probably get it real quick. Um, and some that have a little bit more work to do. Right. But yeah. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. Yep. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions for Jonathan? Hi, Jonathan. So I hey. thought it was a very good presentation. I learned a lot from it. Um, very informative. Um, so I was going to bring up what Rich mentioned about the underreporting of injuries when your goal is having zero injuries. Um, because the employees don't want to mess up your perfect score or your 364 days without an injury going on a year, and then someone gets injured, and that can lead to underreporting. But um, in regards to zero injuries, so throughout the years, I've learned that if you're having near misses, then you can't have zero injuries because near misses are injuries that didn't happen because of the luck factor. And I kind of just wanted to see your view on this. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think if you, if you consider a near, this is just my opinion, so take it for what it's worth. Um, but if you think of an, a near miss as an injury, 
and and you start i mean it depends on what you do with that are you gonna are you setting goals and objectives and um are you giving are you looking at it as a leading indicator or a lagging indicator and, and what kind of of rewards are tied to it if you're if you're tying rewards to if we get if we get 100 near misses reported in this month or in two months um we're going to reward everybody you know you just have to be careful how you how you drive it um i've never really thought of it as an injury myself um and looked at it as a, as kind of a, a a leading indicator of how we can can get better um but you know i could see where that argument would come in but i don't i don't think that um i think if you take it to that level it's considering it an injury sometimes it might it could be taking it too far but every organization is different we all on this call can implement things differently and i think that's that's what um what i would say and and it's it if you use it for the power that it has however you want to call it is is good but if you're making it to where it's punitive and people are going to drive it underground um it's it's going to be a, a definite problem and it's just like the old adage of what do you reward people for if if you give a truck away every year for it they put everybody's name in a drawing for if you are injury free you win a truck which i know people used to do um that's going to drive things underground but if you if you make all your incentives and, and the rewards based upon those leading indicators and driving them and doing them you're going to see and not talk about those lagging indicators you're going to see the lagging indicators follow and that's really kind of the approach that that i've always used but good 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 uh challenging question perfect thank you Yeah, this is Rich again, and with that, uh, we're seven minutes after the hour, and uh, if you have any questions for Jonathan, uh, he's got, you know, you, you have your, everyone has his contact information, so I would encourage you guys to go ahead and reach out to him. And lastly, what I want to talk about now is uh, next month, we have our general meeting. It's May, or excuse me, March 30th, and it'll be over the noon hour at uh, Frederick Meyer Garden. And we're going to be going through uh, uh, tours in terms of the construction site. Right now, they're going through $150 million expansion. And uh, the project is not expected to be complete until 2023. And there's a lot going on over there. They've already opened up some of it to the general public. And uh, I've been there myself. And I can tell you that it has a big city feel. It's not small town Grand Rapids anymore once you go through this facility. And it's amazing. And our host will be a gentleman by the name of uh, Bill Schoonevelt. He is the former president of OAK, which is the general contractor out there at that site. So hope to see you guys out there. We'll get the invites to you and with more information and that type of thing. So without, uh, with that, uh, I just want to again thank Jonathan Zimmerman for uh, giving his presentation. I think we've all learned uh, some, or I've gotten some takeaways, whether you're new into the field or you've been uh, doing safety, health, and health uh, safety for about 20, 30 years or so. Uh, we never stop learning, just like we never want to stop aiming for zero. And that's why uh, we do what we do. And I want to thank everyone for their participation, uh, attendance, and hope to see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Bye Thanks. for now. Bye.